Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar on TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, we're doing this webinar because just so that we can actually know, um, we have consultations coming up with the International Trade Committee, and it's really important for us to get our facts and arguments together so that we can be really effective in trying to defeat this. So um, we at the Council of Canadians have invited Hadrian Mertens Kirkwood, and he is a researcher at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, where he works on international trade and climate change policy. Um, he's written a lot of work um, on the free trade agreements, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership and CETA, which we all know and hate. Um, and his work, he's really um, focused on Canada's migrant worker regime. And he's actually uh, working on a SHRC funded project on Canadian climate po um, change policy at the federal and provincial level. And he's looking at the intersections between trade and the environment. He has an MA in political economy from Carleton University and his major research project was a critical analysis of the TPP. He's here in Ottawa. Um, we're gonna also ask that people hold off on their questions until after the, um, the seminar. So we're gonna have him do the seminar and then we're gonna have questions. And then afterwards, we're gonna start trying to discuss you know, what some of the things we can do for the consultations. So with all further, without further ado, okay, Hadrian, take it away. All right, great, thank you very much. Um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity. I think it's, it's great that um, for us as researchers, we spend a lot of time kind of in the weeds of these deals and uh, we don't always feel like we have an audience for that and, and on you know it's great that we get to meet up with people who are on the front lines of, of this debate and, and of this um, you know this challenge to the CPP who don't necessarily have the time um, and ability to go through through these deals in the depth that we do so it's really great that we have these sort of these events um, to bring to bring everyone together um, yeah, I mean, ideally this would be a very, if we were in a room together, I'd take questions as we go, but that's going to be kind of tough given this format. So, I mean, you can type clarification questions and I'll try to notice them. Um, if I miss them, then, uh, Sujata can, can flag, flag me down and, and I can try and address those. Otherwise we'll have, um, hopefully half an hour at the end, at least 20 minutes to, um, to talk about, um, to talk about clarification and details in the presentation and, and then also more broadly, um, strategic questions about the consultation moving forward. So we've got um, a kind of a, a big agenda here, but we're going to be looking and talking about a lot of issues in a little bit of detail. And, and then if we want to go into more detail in the, in the questions, we can do that. Um, so I'm going to open with a kind of general context about the TPP, some, some history and general information that you might not be aware of at this point. And then we'll go into look at um, I've identified nine key issues. There are more than that, um, but nine issues that I think we can really uh, sink our teeth into um, for the purpose of these consultations. Talk a little bit about um, places you can go for more information resources, and then we'll end with our discussion. Okay, great. So firstly, what is the TPP? I think we all have a general sense in this crowd, but um, so we're all on the same page. As you know, it's the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Um, it is ostensibly a free trade agreement and specifically it's a regional free trade agreement or plurilateral um, which means it's not all countries like the WTO and it's not just two countries um, like a like our bilateral investment treaties but it's a select group which is important because it's a very strange group of countries actually um, when you look at the 12 that are involved um, and I mentioned that it's it's hard for for campaigners and, and citizens really to, to dig into these deals. And part of the reason is the TPP is 6,000 pages long when you include all the annexes. Uh, there's 30 chapters. And the 30 chapters are really not about trade for the most part. There's, there's five or six chapters in there that address traditional trade issues and the rest of them go well beyond to address um, what are called behind the border measures. And that includes environmental issues, labor issues, public services, their own enterprises, all kinds of, of stuff that um, most Canadians don't think of when you talk about free trade. Uh, and that's what this deal is really about. Um, the TPP is unprecedented in a lot of ways and that it, it, it goes um, further than ever in terms of the corporate rights that are included. But at the same time, it's not, um, it's not a radical departure from past deals. It really is built on the NAFTA model. 
Um, that's on purpose. It's a U.S. led agreement. Um, they call it, it's been called by um, advocates, the sort of NAFTA of the Pacific. And then by critics, it's been called NAFTA on steroids. But I think everyone agrees that uh, this is based on NAFTA and it just goes further, further than NAFTA in just about every way. Um, the TPP is also very similar to CETA, uh, which is important because the government has said there's potential issues in the TPP we should consult, but CETA is a done deal. It's the gold standard. But from our perspective, they're very similar um, and, and they have basically the same issues uh, in both CETA and TPP. So although we're not talking about CETA today, um, that's something to be aware of. It's not like these are two totally different things. They're, they're basically the same deal with a different partner. Uh, like I mentioned, it's a, it's a diverse and strange membership. I'll show a map in a second. Uh, it's also important to note that this is not um, a closed group. There's a, a clause in the TPP built in to add other countries over time. And, and I've listed here six countries that have expressed interest. That doesn't mean they've committed to joining it or anything. But all of six of these countries have said, yes, we'd consider joining the TPP after it's, after it's been ratified. Here are the the 12 countries that are involved at this point. Um, as you can see, it's geographically diverse. It's also culturally and economically diverse. Japan is a very different economy than Brunei, for example. Peru is very different from the US. Um, and it makes for some strange compromises when you talk about free trade between such different countries. Um, and more importantly, it, it really highlights uh, difference in power between countries um, because this is ultimately a US agreement. Just a little bit of timeline. So uh, Sujata mentioned that I wrote my, my master's paper on the TPP, but that doesn't mean I just graduated this year. It's actually, this deal has been around for a long time for those of us who have been looking at it. It originated in this 2005 agreement between, between Brunei, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Singapore. In 2008, the US kind of saw this as a, as a nice framework to build a new deal, which it started in 2008, that's the TPP. Canada joined four years later, and there's some issues there, which I'll talk about. Um, and still at this point, most, of, most Canadians haven't heard of the TPP. It's not until October 2015, uh, you might recall during the election, the Harper government announced the conclusion of negotiations. Um, that's really the first time most Canadians had heard of the TPP. The next month in November, the text was released to the public. We finally had our first chance to look at these 6,000 pages. Um, but then just two months later, they signed the deal and said, Don't, no more changes are possible. So we had basically two months in there, um, mo all of January and some of November, to review 6,000 pages of legal text before the government kind of put their stamp on it. Um, to be clear, in terms of how this process looks moving forward, so the TPP has been signed. That means all the parties have agreed to the text as it stands. Um, that means changes are not possible. For the most part, it doesn't mean we shouldn't demand changes, um, but realistically, that the text is close. It's not going to to be reopened. Um, the deadline for ratification, which is whether or not a country like Canada actually implements the deal, um, every country has two years to do that. So for us, that's February 2018. Um, so between now and then, the government is going to have a yes or no vote on the TPP, basically, not not to change it, but just a yes or no on whether or not to ratify the TPP, and that's. That's kind of where we're at in the campaign process is um, is trying to get that no vote basically um, because unfortunately there's not much we can do about changing it. Um, I include this again, just a little bit more context. Um, this is an American deal very clearly. So I've included the logo here that the US trade representative is using to, to sell the deal in the US. So this is not like a, we didn't make this. This is what the actual US government how they're branding the TPP. It's made in America. It's a made in America agreement, which sort of raises a question for the other 11 countries. Um, like, did we not also make this agreement? And really the short answer is no. This is um, US negotiators, basically at the behest of US corporate lobbyists wrote the TPP. There's a lot of evidence of that um, and pushed it on the rest of the countries involved. Um, Canada was swept up in this. The TPP is not something we sought out. Uh, it was something that we were afraid of missing out on. And the Harper government was like, we should probably be in on this if the US is doing it. Um, but this was not a what we call an offensive negotiation. 
which is when the Canadian government is trying to get something from other countries, it was very defensive. It was, we went in to not be left out, um, to not be screwed too badly. Um, that was our approach to these, this, this negotiation, and that sort of reflects the outcome as well. Um, and they're definitely outside of the economic goals. Um, Obama and, and the U.S. have been very clear. This is a geopolitical agreement, um, part of the Obama administration's pivot to Asia, to uh, sort of contain China economically. Um, and they've been very explicit about this. Um, they've been clear that it's about much more than just economic growth or whatever else free trade advocates say. There's U.S. geopolitical goals at, at play here. And the, my last bit of context, I, I outlined the timeline for negotiations, but a few things I want to highlight. One, again, Canada entered this deal sight unseen, which is to say that in 2012, it was four years into negotiations. The Canadian government said, please let us in. And the U.S. said, OK, you can join the negotiations, but you can't look at what we've negotiated first and you can't change any of that once you get here. You have to accept everything that's been established so far and you can only negotiate with what's left over. And the Canadian government said, sure. So we, we joined and couldn't change anything that had already been negotiated. Um, once we were there, it was negotiated behind closed doors. Um, which is to say there was very little, if any, civil society involvement. Um, there was very little parliamentary involvement. Most MPs couldn't actually um, view the text in any way. And yet there was strong influence from corporate lobbyists. I've got some great quotes in a second. Um, another issue, it was concluded by a caretaker government. Um, so after the, uh, the writ had been dropped, as they say, um, the Harper government said, yep, we, we put the, the, the final touches on this deal and concluded it. Um, there's some questions about whether that's actually constitutional, although I don't know that that's a really going to be a productive sort of line of criticism at this point, but there are, there are questions there. And, and then the new government, even though they had just started the consultation process, which as you know is ongoing, signed the deal anyway. Um, and I've got Christian Freeland, our new trade minister, saying there, um, you know, it's too soon to endorse the TPP, it's also too soon to say no. And that, that kind of like sounding cautiousness is going to be a, a common theme, um, I think, moving forward. It, it's very clear to us from what we're hearing from government and, and from the kind of statements they're making that they very much intend to, to push this deal through. Um, speaking in the U.S. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Trudeau said that the consultation process was an opportunity to um, allay concerns from Canadians which is very different from trying to hear and respond to concerns. Um, so we, we, can't, we can't let them get away with, with making this a formality, this consultation process. Um, we really do need to push, push it a little bit here and, and not let them just get by with a, a sort of, I don't know, meaningless consultation process. And uh, yeah, I mentioned a couple great quotes. You don't have to read this whole thing, but this came a couple months ago at um, committee testimony on the TPP and Perrin Beatty from Business Council of Canada, that's formerly the Canadian Council of Chief Executives, was very clear when asked this question. It was like, yeah, we met with negotiators periodically, as many as 10 times. They responded to our questions. We were in touch from time to time with the minister. Um, we were kept apprised broadly of the direction in which things were going. Which is, was, even though we knew this, we already knew that business groups were involved. It was still shocking to hear them be so upfront about like, yes, we were happy with um, with access we had. Again, here's another one. Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters, big lobby group for for, for major uh, industry. Uh, we felt well consulted, uh, invited to sessions by ministers and officials, lots of opportunity. We were fairly included. And, you know, we saw this at the CCPA and said, and, and, you know, we've been working on these trade issues for decades, not necessarily me personally, but as an organization. And we barely talked to government once in, in the 10 years that, that Harper was in power. Um, we just weren't really, uh, they didn't want us to have a seat at the table in any, in any meaningful way. And, and to hear these business groups say, yeah, we had great access to negotiators was a bit of a slap in the face, but I mean, it reflects that negotiating process. So there, that's some, I think, important context. I think there might hopefully some something new and useful in there for you. Um, so we're going to dive into, I've identified um, nine key issues. Uh, to be clear, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, a big one that uh, occurs to me that we're not talking about is the auto sector. Um, but if people want to know a bit more, we can talk about that in questions. So I'm going to go through these 
fairly quickly. Um, the way I've structured it is a few key facts about this issue, a few clarifications, and then I'm ending with a key question, um, which is a sort of a sample question you might take to a consultation if given the opportunity. So we'll start with investor state dispute settlement. This is the probably highest profile issue in the TPP and other deals uh, for good reason. And it's really, we can't hammer on this point enough. Um, the fact that this, it's what we call a quasi-judicial process, which means it looks like a legal process, but it's not part of the legal system. And it's for investors to dispute violations of a state's obligation under the terms of an FTA. So um, if a state doesn't uphold its investment commitments in the TPP, it allows a, a investor, foreign investor, not a domestic investor, but a foreign investor to challenge that violation uh, and claim compensation for it. Uh, importantly, this decision is made by a tribunal of for-profit arbitrators. This is, I mean, this whole system is what Gus Van Harten, he's an investment expert, is, he calls it a very corrupt process. There's no civil society involvement, no appeals process. Um, the arbitrators in one case are the, um, the lawyers in another, in a, a different case. They get paid a huge amount of money, so there's a huge incentive to have more of these cases and to rule in favor of business. So the process is, is really problematic. Um, investors can claim compensation for lost future profits. We're seeing that in the Keystone Excel case right now, um, where they're, they're claiming compensation for the money they would have made had Keystone been approved, uh, which is very different from just getting compensation for the money you've invested so far. And the Keystone case is a great one of how ISDS and NAFTA has been used to challenge public health and environmental measures. There are a lot of cases. Um, we've written um, reports about this specifically, uh, Canada's experience under NAFTA, uh, governments uh, overturning public health measures, paying a compensation to investors because of, uh, because of the investment rules in NAFTA, which are basically reproduced in the TPP. And the key question here, and this is, again, something we can't ask enough, is why are we doing this? Why is Canada, which has a robust, fair judicial system, so investors, if they feel like they aren't being treated fairly, can use the Canadian court system to challenge a government measure, why are we giving them an extra special um, sort of pseudo court system to sue our governments for measures taken in the public interest? It, it really is an affront to democracy of the most basic level. And, and most people, when they hear about ISDS for the first time, can't believe it's real. Um, but it is. And uh, we've, we've been burned by it more than any other developed country in the world so far. Uh, there's been more than 35 cases brought against Canada under this system. And the TPP will, will just expose us even further. So, I mean, they could do a whole presentation on this, but I'll move on. And if there's more clarification, we can bring those questions up at the end. Environmental protection. Um, so the, the first environmental issue is that corporations can use ISDS to sue governments for environmental measures. So the Keystone case is a good example. Obama says, no, we can't build, we or can't yeah, build this pipeline because it's incompatible with our climate goals. The company says, too bad, you got to pay us for that. Um, but there's more. And part of the problem is this so-called greenwashing of the TPP. So we have, there is an environmental chapter in the TPP, which includes environmental protections, uh, but there's a lot of problems. Firstly, they're very limited in scope. They only apply to central government measures uh, and not to provincial or, or other measures. And that's a problem because energy and resources are provincial jurisdiction in Canada. Um, water, wastewater, and so on is municipal jurisdiction for the most part. So none of that stuff is covered to begin with, only federal issues. And then even where stuff is covered, the protections are very, they're aspirational and not obligatory. There's a lot of language like, um, the parties shall strive to implement or the parties um, are encouraged to protect and so on, which is not actually something you can enforce. It's just them saying, we like the idea of the environment, but we're not actually going to commit to protecting it. Importantly, and this is um, somewhat new, is that the, the very limited protections that do exist, they are enforceable through state-to-state -state dispute settlement. Um, but it's a convoluted process. It's not as easy to use as the investor one. And it's only a foreign government that can bring a case. So um, it, it, you can't, and you can only bring a case from one government to another government. So 
you know, if an American corporation is destroying, destroying the environment in Vietnam, for example, the Vietnamese government, or sorry, the Canadian government could sue Vietnam for that. But it's a really weird process that doesn't actually affect the investor itself. And the key question here is like, why can corporations sue governments for violating investment rules, but countries can't sue corporations for violating environmental rules? It's a very lopsided process. And I've added this kind of a bonus question. Again, this is Keystone's a great example, but it's not the only one. And, and this is a question that I don't have the answer to. It's are the TPP's investor protections compatible with Canada's commitments to combat climate change? And there are a lot of people, including Gus Van Harten, who say no, they're, they're not. If we're going to uphold investor protections, we can't uphold rights for the environment. We can't implement sort of subsidies and, and preferential treatment for um, alternative energy because that's that's a, a protectionist measure. So there are a lot of very open and concerning questions about the compatibility of climate change action and, and investor protection in these trade agreements. Shifting gears a bit, internet freedom and privacy. Again, I mean, it's this seems like we're all over the map here. and and we are, because the TPP addresses a, an absurd number of government policy areas. But anyway, internet freedom and privacy is another one. Um, TPP requires criminal penalties for breaking digital locks. Um, to put that really simply, that's if you buy copyrighted material, so you buy a CD and, and then you copy it to your computer and sell it. Um, under Canadian law, you can, be ch you can pay a fine for that, but it's not a criminal act. And the TPP makes that a criminal act. Um, which is uh, pretty ridiculous that this trade agreement is forcing us to rewrite um, criminal law in Canada. It also extends copyright terms, um, which will delay the availability of, of literature and other works into the public domain. Um, concerns there, especially from uh, libraries and schools, which, which often use those copyrighted materials. It's going to cost them more to continue to do so. Um, a new thing in the TPP is it prohibits data localization requirements. And what that means is um, governments sometimes uh, pass laws that say, if you're a foreign media company and you come into our country and collect private information about our citizens, so if you're Facebook, you're based in the US, but you collect information about Canadian citizens, we might require you to store that information in Canada, which is a very reasonable um, regulation from a privacy perspective. It's very common in the EU. For example, to say, uh, yeah, if you're going to store our citizen information, you have to store it in our country. Um, because if you can store it in the U.S., then it's subject to the U.S. government uh, laws, such as the Patriot Act, for example. So there's some real concerns there. The TPP makes that um, completely uh, prohibited. So countries can no longer do that. Um, there's no longer any barrier if the TPP is signed for a Facebook or Google or Amazon or whoever to collect Canadians' data and store it on U.S. servers where it's subject to U.S. government search and seizure. So that's a big issue for privacy. Now, there are, like the environmental stuff, there are protections for privacy, user privacy, but they're extremely weak. Um, so there's, a, there's this great passage that says, you know, governments must create a strong framework for the protection of their citizens' um, privacy. And then there's a footnote that says, the, this commitment can be met through voluntary industry action, which is basically saying, you know, pr private, it's fine. Like, as long as you trust the corporations to enforce privacy rights, that's fine. You meet the requirements here, which is very different from requiring strong legislation um, at the central government level. Key question here, and there's a lot um, in this area, but why is Canada rewriting democratically en enacted legislation, specifically the 2012 Copyright Modernization Act, which we just like very recently negotiated. Um, it was a it was a hard fought bipartisan compromise. I mean, we're not totally happy with the outcome, but it's certainly more balanced than the TPP. And we're gonna have to rewrite that that act to comply with industry demands. Um, why are we doing that? And that's, again, a common thread of rewriting Canadian law to comply with an international trade agreement that has in areas that have very little to do with trade. Healthcare costs, you might be familiar with this. Um, so let's just say this very simply. Basically, there's more protections for pharmaceutical manufacturers. We estimate that will increase the cost of drugs by about 5% in Canada. Um, it also locks in other measures. And by locks in, I mean, it doesn't change them. So our patent linkage system, data protections for biologics. The TPP doesn't change current Canadian law, 
but it does make it impossible to go back on those systems. So if we say in the future, that's not a good system for us, too bad, we have to keep it. Um, key question here, why are we consenting to higher drug costs? We already have some of the highest per capita drug costs in the industrialized world. So there, I mean, there are other health issues, but the cost is a very simple one. And the government admits it. They've admitted that it's going to raise the cost of drugs in Canada. A couple issues here. First one is, um, you may be familiar with the supply management issue. Basically, the TPP increases the tariff rate, tariff rate quotas for dairy and poultry. And uh, although not by a big amount, sort of, you know, 3%, uh, it, does, it does kind of chip away at the supply managed agricultural system. Um, we shouldn't exaggerate here and say that this is going to destroy supply management. That's not the case but it is gonna affect its viability moving forward, especially coupled with CETA. If both TPP and CETA are ratified, it does actually represent a pretty significant um, attack on supply management. Separate issue, weaker food standards um, threaten Canadian food safety. So for example, Canada does not allow um, bovine growth hormone in, in cows producing fluid milk, but under TPP, um, US milk, U.S. fluid milk, which can be produced with bovine growth hormone, is allowed to be imported to Canada and sold in Canada. It doesn't have to be labeled. So Canadians might not know that their fluid milk now contains um, milk from cows using bovine growth hormone, which is not currently allowed. Uh, and that's, I mean, again, big issue. Not really on the radar for a lot of people. Why is this in a trade deal? Um, but the key question, again, why is Canada eroding supply-managed agricultural system? It's a system that works. It provides Canadians with safe, reliable food, supports Canadian farmers. And uh, to sort of preempt one of the criticisms here, people say, well, Canadian farmers should compete with other farmers around the world, just like any other industry. The problem is every other agricultural industry around the world is heavily subsidized, especially in Europe, New Zealand, US, heavy food um, and agricultural subsidies. And Canada does not subsidize its farmers. It protects them using supply management. It's a different kind of protectionist measure. But if we get rid of that and say our unsubsidized dairy must now compete with subsidized New Zealand dairy, it's game over for Canadian farmers. Um, so whatever you have to say about supply management, it's, it's just a different approach to subsidies for, the, for that industry. Public services, I think this is worth flagging. There are a lot of concerns about public services. They're, the concerns are bigger in CETA, to be clear. The TPP has a lot more exceptions here, but there are still some restrictions. Um, State-owned enterprises engaged in commercial activity, so you know the CBC, insofar as it delivers commercial products, um, must act in a commercial way, which again restricts um, restricts how state-owned enterprises are permitted to operate. Uh, there are exceptions again for CBC, so it's hard to make any you know cut and dry statements about public services. The the bigger issue for public services is not how it affects. Um, Canadian public services right now, um, it's that it affects it in the future. So it's got this so-called standstill and ratchet clause, which basically says the current level of privatization in Canada is locked in. And if you privatize any further, you can't go backwards. So if Canada decides like, let's give it a shot, let's privatize the CBC, and then decides after two years, like, wow, that was a bad decision, we should go back to public control of this broadcaster. You can't do that. That's what the ratchet clause means. You can only move in one direction. Um, so that's the biggest concern. And it's, it's coupled with this negative list approach, which says you can, res exempt, you can exempt public services, but you have to name them all right now. And that means like we, we don't know what public services we might need in 10 years or 20 years. Uh, but since we didn't list them right now, we can never create them in the future. It's, it's this, crazy, permanent, um, far-reaching approach that we might not notice in the short term, but we'll certainly notice in the long term as we try to create new or expand old public services. So a key question, why aren't public services fully protected? Um, not only now against the TPP's generous investor protections, but also into the future, because this negative list applies forever. Local development, just uh, quickly flag this, because this is not a new issue in the TPP. But basically, the TPP prohibits by Canadian or any other sort of local content requirements, uh, at least at the federal level and uh, to a certain extent at the provincial level, um, which is a, an issue for a lot of governments that want to um, encourage local development. 
So outside of this, you could have a certain provincial entity say, hey, we want to, um, you know, we want to build this big hydro project, but we want you to make sure you have to hire like 50% Canadian workers to do this or, or, or specifically workers from this, this community. Um, and that's, that's prohibited under the TPP. Uh, and there are, again, there are exceptions here, but we don't think they're strong enough um, and far reaching enough. Uh, it will affect how governments spend their money to a certain extent, um, which will, again, affect local development initiatives. Key question, why did we sacrifice the right to do this? Um, it's an important local development tool. To be clear, this restriction, again, already exists under NAFTA, already exists under the WTO. The TPP just expands it to more, more provincial entities, more federal entities. So it continues to chip away at, at this local development tool of uh, by Canadian. And I've got, we're almost through all the key issues. Um, labor and migrant workers. The first is, like the environment chapter, uh, there is a labor rights chapter in the TPP. Like the environment chapter, it's basically aspirational and not actually enforceable. Um, the, the Canadian Labor Congress has been very vocal about this. It, it sounds good, the TPP labor chapter, doesn't really have a lot of substance. We have a lot of concerns. Uh, like the environment chapter, it's only enforceable through state-to-state -state dispute. So that means that um, if, again, Vietnam fails to uphold its rights uh, in, the, in the deal, it, it's, uh, sorry, if Vietnam fails to uphold labor rights as it signs up to in the TPP, those workers can't actually dispute it. And civil society groups in Canada can't actually dispute it. It would have to be the Canadian government going to the Vietnamese government and saying, you need to enforce these rights better. So it's a, it's a problematic indirect system that's not at all comparable to the investor rights, where investors don't have to wait for their government to get involved. They can directly sue a government. So it's very unbalanced. And a separate issue here is the, uh, the so-called temporary entry. Um, this is the area that I, I personally work in um, and have done a lot of research on. And the TPP is, is similar to NAFTA in that it allows certain kinds of workers to enter Canada without an economic needs test. Um, the TPP expands those categories. So there's a greater, um, more diverse set of workers uh, and, a, and a more um, a sort of easygoing standard for what, what qualifies as a business visitor. So, for example, um, the TPP includes like carpenters and plumbers, not what we might consider business visitors, but those kinds of workers, if they're from a TPP country um, or, or an, a covered TPP country, can now enter Canada, don't need a work permit, or sorry, they need a work permit, but they don't need a visa. Um, they don't need a, a labor market impact assessment, which is important. Uh, labor market impact assessment is it's what the temporary foreign worker program uses, which is a lot of problems with that program, let's not kid ourselves, but at least what that process does is it says if you're an employer, you have to prove that you tried to hire local workers first. You know, you, you searched for a few weeks, there was no one available, um, there's, yeah, there's just not enough workers or qualified workers, so you had to hire someone internationally. You can now hire the exact same worker through the TPP um, without requiring that process. They're, they're exempt from those economic needs tests even if domestic workers are available, even if unemployment is high. So we have some concerns there that it, it really limits the Canadian government's ability to control the domestic labor market. And that's the key question. Why did Canada give up the right to impose restrictions on the number of migrant workers entering the country under the terms of the TPP? Um, and I do want to make an important point here, which is our, our position is not that we don't want workers from other countries coming to Canada. But our problem is that you shouldn't have these migrant workers coming in for six months at a time that you can exploit and then export. Um, if we genuinely need workers, because that's the debate in Atlantic Canada right now, and we don't have enough workers for seafood processing and so on, you either need to raise wages enough that, that uh, those Canadians wanted to work there, or need to allow these migrant workers to actually immigrate and stay in Canada. You know, if they're good enough to work here, they should be good enough to live here. But the current system basically allows employers to bring workers in on a short-term basis, kind of exploit them for what they're worth, like send them back to where they came from. Um, and those workers don't get the, don't get the benefit, doesn't solve the, the Canadian labor market's long-term problems. So we have issues with this migrant worker approach. And the last kind of key issue I want to highlight 
And when I talk about the TVP, I often lead with this because it's, it is important context, but I thought I'd leave it at the end because it's just to really drive home the point that the TPP is not really about trade. Um, if you look at Canadian exports to TPP countries right now, they're already 97% tariff free, which means we're not getting new market access really through the TPP. This is not about expanding trade opportunities. Um, we can already sell all our goods as much as we want to all these countries. Um, it's really about creating new rights and, and basically rules around investment that favor investors at the expense of, of citizens and workers. Um, and that's like that Obama quote I had earlier. It's about writing the rules um, for trade and investment. It's not necessarily about increasing trade or creating growth. And you see that um, from the estimates for GDP growth for the TPP, the, the most positive, most optimistic forecasts say it's, we might see about 1% um, GDP growth uh, in the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, the more pessimistic forecasts are around 0%, as in no growth. And yet, um, one of the most high-profile forecasts uses a UN development model, says that there are, um, or predicts around 58,000 job losses in Canada in the, next, in the first 10 years of the TPP. I mean, the, the specific number isn't important, like 58,000 could be anything. The point is, is that growth can occur and you can still have job losses. And you might ask, like, how is that possible? If the economy is growing, shouldn't there be more jobs? No, not if that growth is going to a small group of people or a small group of corporations. Um, and that's what the UN model predicts, is that there will be a small, a small amount of growth, but basically all of those gains will go to corporations and investors. They will not be shared with workers. You will actually see job losses and wage declines. Um, and, and to really, again, this is absurd to me, um, but the Canadian government doesn't actually have an opinion about this. You, so I would encourage you to ask these questions, like 97% of exports are already tariff-free, um, independent forecasts show very little growth in job losses, what does the Canadian government have to say? And they have nothing to say because they have done no internal economic impact assessment of the TPP. Um, and they admit to this, the Canadian government does not know. They do not know what the TPP will do to the Canadian economy. They just haven't asked the question. They haven't bothered to look. Um, and for me, as, a, as an economist, that's a really, this is one of the most damning questions, although all the other ones are important too. And it's, why are we signing onto a deal with such large concrete risks, risks like all the ones I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, um, very clear regulatory risks, environmental risks, and so on, in exchange for such small and uncertain benefits. We don't know if and how we'll benefit from this deal at all. And yet the government is pushing ahead. So that's, I mean, that, that one makes me upset. I mean, a lot of these should make us upset, but this one is really ridiculous. The Canadian government just has not, has not done an assessment at all of what the impact of the TPP will be on the economy. Um, real quickly, uh, we have um, some resources that kind of go to, I'll point you to, um, is the series that, that we're publishing at the CCPA. So I'm not sure if you can click on these links, um, but hopefully if we, we send this out, um, I can actually post this for you right now. Um, we're, we're currently publishing a research series called What's the Big Deal, where we look at each of these issues I've talked about in, in significantly more detail. Um, we have four, four reports that have been published, two more coming out this week. We have about six or seven more on deck um, that look at these issues in much more detail than I've, I've described today. A couple people to look, in, to, uh, look into, Gus Van Harten, really is one of the foremost um, experts on, on these investor protections. He, he works out of York University. Michael Geist works out of the University of Ottawa. He's the expert on intellectual property and, and privacy issues. He's written extensively on the TPP. And then there are campaign groups that are doing a lot of great work. Council of Canadians, of course, um, Open Media, focused more on, on the internet issues, but, but on TPP generally. Lead Now is starting a campaign around the consultations. So there are people doing work on this, but not as much as we'd like. So anyway, that's why we're doing this What's the Big Deal series, trying to fill in the gaps from a research perspective. Um, but there are, there are other resources out there too. And that brings us to um, a discussion. So I might ask Sujata to jump back in here. I'm not sure um, if you're going to moderate this or, or how we should do this. Um, but I can start to take, start to take questions um, 
by by text, I guess. Um, unless uh, Sujata has a has a better idea here. They're seeing a few um, few other resources trying to unmute. Yeah, there are a couple of good videos and yeah, good yeah, T tip. That it, it's tricky because there's a lot of trade deals we're talking about right now, not just TPP and CETA, but there is TTIP, which is the sort of US EU deal. Um, there's the TISA agreement, the trade and services agreement, which you probably haven't, haven't heard about, but it's uh, it's likely to be concluded by the end of this year, which is another big one that we'll be <laughs> fighting next year. I'm, I can promise you that. 